Hey, good morning and welcome to the services here at the Lake Merced Church of Christ in beautiful and slightly smoky San Francisco. It is October, October 4th, and it's hard to believe that we've been doing this now almost seven months. But we are here and it is a, a glorious morning to praise God. Every day is a great day to praise God. As we get started this morning, I wanna invite you into a sacred space. I wanna invite you to, to just be fully present in your heart and in your mind. Uh, be willing to sing, but let your neighbors know that you love Jesus. And, and let's get ready to praise his holy name. If you have not clicked like yet, or clicked share, I would love to ask you to do that. If these messages bless you, uh, we would love to ask you to share them with somebody in, in, your, in your life, in your newsfeed, somewhere. Uh, God bless you, let's praise God. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, church. Let's pray together. Through our Lord Jesus the Christ, we enter into your presence, our Father God in heaven, and in the Holy Spirit. We assemble together this first day of the week to worship you, though remotely now due to concerns over the worldwide COVID plague that has robbed multitudes of life and health. We turn to you as the God of our salvation and deliverance in the midst of the crisis, knowing that you have been faithful to your people who have called upon your name through the ages. In recalling your rescue of those you have chosen, we realize anew that you are the Lord we can trust as we submit ourselves to your will. Again, we acknowledge that without the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus offering of himself to you, salvation would be impossible. We ask that you might prepare our hearts to offer adoration to you this hour in a manner well pleasing to you in our songs of praise, prayers, the offering back to you of a portion of the resources you have blessed us with, the declaration at the Lord's table of salvation through the offering of Christ Jesus, and in the preaching of your word of truth by our brother Josh. May we be transformed in our worship of you to become more like our Lord Jesus better prepare to follow him this coming week and declare in word and deed his gospel of salvation. Grant that we will be more ready to meet the challenges we will face, whatever they may be, in the days to come. We adore and thank you, our Father God, for electing us to be ministers of reconciliation, our highest calling in Christ Jesus. In his holy name, we pray, amen. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens, praise his name, praise Jehovah. Oh, pray. 
regularly assembled, one of the central aspects of our service is that we are gathered together to take the Lord's Supper, or what's called communion. Uh, during this time of uh, the COVID, we, due to the restrictions, are not able to uh, meet together, but we simply, through this medium of our electronic gathering, we do our best to remember collectively Christ's death on the cross. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 23 through 26. This is where the Apostle Paul recounts to the Corinthian church the instructions he was given uh, directly from Jesus himself concerning how Jesus wanted his death remembered. 
Apostle Paul writes, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is in the new covenant. Is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If we were gathered together, we'd have the emblem of the unleavened bread, which Jesus used in the first communion, or we'd have grape juice, or as it's called the Bible, the fruit of the vine, as elements to uh, take in to help us remember exactly as Jesus told us to remember. But many may not have access to those elements now that were separated, but if you do, you can have those in front of you, and in just a moment we'll pray, and then we'll take those elements, or simply if you do not have those elements, you can Reflect in your heart and in your mind upon the great sacrifice that was made for you and made for me that we might live and have our sins forgiven and be with God uh, forever. Let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer at this time. A great and holy God, we worship your name and we thank you for your love which knows no bounds and that gave up what was most precious to you, that is your Son, that we might live. We have no hope, Father, of being before you with our own sinfulness that's been left unchecked and that can no way be made up by any goodness. But we come before you instead through the sacrifice of your Son. He gave his body, which represents his life, and he gave his blood, which also represents his life, that we might be forgiven through his sacrifice. And we know, Father, that's the only way we can be forgiven. And help us this morning to reflect properly in our own individual setting upon the sacrifice as you would intend us to reflect. And may these thoughts and remembrances uh, be carried with us all throughout the week as we meet the week's challenges. And may we remember who we are and who we belong to and what's been done for us. This we pray through your Son, Jesus. Amen. We are not assembled at this time, but still there's an opportunity or a way to give uh, online. If you go to lakemercedchurch.com, there's a link for online giving. You can give electronically by either setting up a one-time payment or you can set up a recurring payment. Again, go to lakemercedchurch.com. There is a second way that you can give on your phone. By sending a text to the number 84321, you can text a dollar amount to that number and get a text back with all the instructions that you need to make a contribution or give towards the work of the Lord taking place at Lake Merced. Again, you can text 84321 and all the instructions will be given to you there through that text. Thank you very much. I'm pressing on 
on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table and a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Have you ever tried to focus on something just like right in front of you, only to, to completely lose sight of it? Uh, I feel like that happens to me all the time because I, I fit right into that cliche mold where guys can't seem to find that thing that's right in front of their face. And so what do I do? Well, hey, Tiff. Do you know where that thing is? Yeah, it should be right there. I don't see it. And of course, you know how this goes, right? She, she walks over, she reaches her hand out, and she grabs that thing that's right in front of my face. And I walk away thankful, but a, a little embarrassed that I, I missed something that was so obvious right here in front of me. And I seem to find a way to do that with, with lots of things. You know, this week was the, the beginning of the baseball playoffs. And if you know me, then you know that I'm a, well, I'm an A's fan. And so all week long, while I'm trying to focus on my sermon or, or some other bit of work that I have to do, uh, Major League Baseball was so kind as to schedule the A's game on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, right at noon, every single day. Uh, I, I never went so far as to not work but I found that my focus on work was divided. I just kept wondering what was going on in the game. Like, how were the A's doing? Were they winning? Were they losing? And so I'm like, I, I have to know. So I, I jump over and I check the score and I probably stay a few minutes longer than I really ought to and then try to get back to what I was doing or supposed to be doing before all that happened. Uh, it's kind of part of the curse of being an A's fan, right? There, there are so few of us that when the A's actually make the playoffs, we always get the, the early day games because they, they know that nobody is going to watch the game anyway. I hope that's not the case for this series because I'm personally really excited to preach this series to you and with you and share it with you. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time today, we are beginning a new sermon series that I'm calling Greater Than, Greater Than. For the next eight weeks, as part of this series, we're gonna be working through the book of Hebrews. Now, I don't know if you've ever spent much time in the book of Hebrews, but there are, are very few opportunities in which I would usually feel great about teaching or preaching this book. And here's why. Uh, aside from Revelation, Hebrews is, is probably one of the most difficult books uh, to read and to appreciate because Hebrews assumes some things about the reader. Namely, that the reader is very, very familiar with the Old Testament, and, and particularly two parts of the Old Testament. The, the Torah, or, or the books of the law, which are, are comprised of the first five books of the Bible. You have Genesis, and Exodus, and Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the Psalms. And so there are, are lots, and lots, and lots of references to those two areas of the Old Testament in Hebrews. And frankly, a lot of churches today just don't really spend enough time in the Old Testament, which means that much of the meaning of the language of this book often just goes right over people's heads. But here's why I chose to do this now uh, with all of you. 
Number one, I know our Lake Merced people. And I know that our people, that you, love to learn and know your Bibles. And so I definitely encourage you to have your pens, your notebooks, your highlighters, all that stuff handy, uh, because you're going to have an opportunity to use it. Now, it doesn't mean that these are going to be super long sermons. I'm trying not to do that. But you're going to get so much more out of this series if you're prepared to learn each and every week. And number two, we just finished coming off two sermon series where we spent a considerable amount of time working through some Old Testament themes. Our, our captive series was a long series that was working through the exile of Israel to the nation of Babylon. And, and it touched on, on most of the, the major and minor prophets. And then our most recent series, One Kingdom Indivisible, was a, a super quick and fruitful journey from Genesis to Revelation that took about eight weeks. We, we covered kind of the whole story. So I think you're ready. I think you're ready to jump into Hebrews. I think you're ready to chew on, on this, this little bit of, of biblical meat, so to speak. So I want to give you a little bit of backstory on the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is a book that may not have actually started out as a book at all, but it was likely something like a sermon that was later turned into a book. Uh, the author of Hebrews is currently unknown. Uh, I and, and some others often tend to, to lean toward the Apostle Paul as being the, the author, but there are plenty of other scholars who believe that there are things written in Hebrews that just don't sound anything like him, that they're, they're written from a different voice than the rest of Paul's letters were written. And so whatever it might be, or whoever it may be, Hebrews is an academically rigorous text. It is expertly written and crafted by someone who is extremely skilled in, in imagery and writing. And most scholars seem to believe that it was written primarily for, for Christians who were meeting in, in house churches in an urban or, or a city environment, likely in or around somewhere like Rome. And, and these Christians were likely part of a Hellenistic diaspora of Jewish believers in Jesus. In other words, these were people who, who have been heavily influenced by Greek thinkers of their day. They're likely living in Italy, as, as Hebrews 13 seems to mention, uh, rather than being Aramaic-speaking Jews in or around Judea or Judah. And so for these believers, something has gone amiss for the writer of Hebrews. Uh, the, the writer is concerned that they've lost their way. They've, they've lost their focus on what really matters in their faith. And, and we get some insight into this later on in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. I invite you to, to read along with me if you would. The, the writer says this, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew, you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. And verse 36 says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And I have to think that the writer's words here are, are relatable probably to every single one of us, that every single one of us can lose sight of our confidence in the things that, that really seem to matter. Like, haven't you ever had those moments where you knew the right thing to do as a Christian, but you just, for whatever reason, like you didn't care to do it, or, or maybe you knew what you were supposed to believe, but you, you weren't sure you really believed it. Well, Hebrews is written to those people, and, and for those people who have forgotten, or who've gotten discouraged, or, or who need that reminder of who or what it is that this, this whole walk with Christ is all about, that, that it's about Christ. And what Hebrews is getting ready to do is, is make this, this beautiful and, and well thought out argument or case for the supremacy of Jesus, the supremacy of Christ. And so I'm calling this series Greater Than, because as you're going to see as we go from this week to week, the, the author's approach in this text is, is to systematically encourage and remind the reader that Jesus is greater. 
He's greater. He wants the reader to see and to understand from Scripture that as, as great as some of these other, uh, other people and entities and traditions have been throughout the biblical story, Jesus is unequivocally greater. And that should have huge implications for their lives, but also for ours. And so what's, what's interesting to me about this text is who the writer begins to speak about. Because we're all familiar with, with some of the key people, some of the key patriarchs in the Old Testament stories. But that's not where the writer begins. In fact, the writer doesn't even begin with humanity at all. Instead, he goes, he goes up into the heavenly realm and he begins to talk about, uh, above all things, angels. Angels. You think about angels, in, in a poll in 2011 from CBS, 77% uh, of adults polled said that they believe angels are real. They believe angels are real. And I would have been among those 77%. And yet, when I think about it, if I'm being honest, like how often do I think about angels? And the answer is almost never, maybe around Christmas. Well, as Christians, we, we talk about Jesus. We, we talk about God. We talk about Satan. We, we talk about demons all before we probably ever stop to consider angels. And yet, for the writer of Hebrews, angels are where he begins. And so as we jump in, I, I think I can explain why a little bit as we go. So I invite you to turn to the very first page of Hebrews. We're gonna begin in Hebrews chapter one, verse one. I'll give you just a moment to get there, take a little drink of my water here, and then we'll continue. Hebrews one, verse one. And here's what the writer says. He says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And I want to preface this by saying that the first two chapters of Hebrews do more to probably inform and shape our understanding of angels than probably any other portion of scripture, that at least that I can think of. And if we wanted this series to be a lesson in understanding both the heavenly realm and the earthly realm and so on, we could spend a lot of time in these two chapters. But this is a book and this is a series with a broader message about the greatness of Jesus. And I wanna make sure that we stay on topic rather than pursuing every possible side conversation that might creep up along the way. So the question is, what is the writer saying as he begins this text? Well, he's reminding his very Jewish readers of how God used to communicate with people, that in the past, in the Old Testament, stories of the, of the prophets and the patriarchs, there were a variety of ways that God chose to communicate a message to the people. But chief among them was through angels. Why? Well, because that was essentially their purpose. Uh, the word angel in the Greek or the original text is a word that simply means messenger. So how did God convey a message? Well, he sent a messenger. Makes sense, right? So you do a quick word search. And, and you look at the word angel, and it reminds us that it, it was an angel that God used to, to send uh, a message to Hagar after she fled from Abram and Sarai. It, it, was, it was angels that God sent to, to Sodom to warn Lot to leave the city. It was an angel that God sent to Abraham and later to Jacob and to so many others throughout the biblical account that when God had a message, he'd send a messenger, he'd send an angel. But what the writer of Hebrews reminds us of, right off the bat, comes in verse two. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And about this son, he reminds the reader that this wasn't just some, some other being, this was the radiance of God's glory, the exact 
representation of his being. In fact, in fact, verse two reminds us, or the reader, that it was through Jesus, through Jesus, that all things were made. The, the author's point is that Jesus has become the new and greater messenger. And so what the, the rest of the chapter, or what the rest of chapter one seeks to accomplish is to explain why that point is true. Look at verse five. Verse five says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've become your father? Or you look at verse six, and verse six reminds the reader that God told the angels to worship the son, not the other way around. Or in verse eight, where he reminds the reader that it was the son who was told that his throne would last forever. In other words, it's the son who becomes king. It's the son who is eternal. In verse 10, he reminds the reader that it was the son who laid the foundation of the earth. And in verse 13, he reminds the reader that it was the son, not the angels, who were invited to sit at the right hand of the father in heaven. And so he concludes chapter one with, with a rhetorical question of sorts. He says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? In other words, it's not for their glory that angels were sent. In fact, it's a strong reminder of why they were sent. That they were sent out of God's plans and love for us. For humanity, they were sent to minister and to serve those who will inherit salvation. And so as chapter two begins, the author builds upon the point that he began to make way back in verse four, that if Jesus is the new and greater messenger, that the, the readers better start to pay attention. He says we, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Church, if, if Jesus is the new and greater messenger, then he brings a new and greater message. And we, the readers, need to pay the most careful attention to that message or we can become susceptible to, among other things, drifting. And so when you think of that word, like when the writer speaks of drifting here, it's not in the casual sense that we often use it or think of it. Like if I lose my train of thought, I might say, oh, sorry, I was drifting. Or, hey, I, I kind of drifted off. The writer here is incorporating like nautical imagery, like that of a boat. That it's, it's not where it should be. It's drifted off. And so we'll see him revisit this imagery again in a few weeks as we look at chapter six, where there he talks about hope. And he says, hope then is an anchor for the soul. So he uses anchor imagery. So if we don't pay more careful attention to the greater messenger and the greater message, the author of Hebrews says, we may find that we have drifted, that we aren't where we thought we were. And we certainly aren't where we should be. Because here's the thing, somewhere along the way, it became accepted in Christian tradition uh, and we see this in the writings of people like uh, Augustine, that when the law or when the Ten Commandments were handed down from God to Moses, it was not direct, but it was through a messenger or through an angel. And again, if you run back to Exodus right now, you'll see this is not explicitly stated in Exodus or in the Moses story. But the writer of Hebrews is acknowledging or referring to the accepted beliefs and understandings of their day, that, that Moses had received the law through angels. And so he's saying in chapter two, verse two, this, he says, for since the message was spoken through angels, or sorry, let me rephrase this, for since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? In other words, he's saying like, hey, dear reader, you received previous messages and previous laws handed down by, by heavenly messengers as binding laws. So what should happen with a greater messenger and a greater message? The, the author's point is that it's binding all the same. He says, how shall we escape if we ignore those words, if we ignore so great a salvation. 
And so he continues by showing us two ways that we received this message of salvation. First, he says that this salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. In other words, Jesus himself gave us a message of salvation when he was here on earth. And we have direct witnesses who heard him and knew him who can vouch for that. But secondarily, and perhaps more importantly, in verse four, it says that God also testified to it by signs and wonders and, and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. He's saying like, like think back to what happened on, on the day of Pentecost in, in Acts chapter two, where the, the Holy Spirit comes on Jesus' disciples and they begin doing all sorts of amazing things. They speak in other languages, they, they heal people, all kinds of stuff. He's saying those weren't just some neat tricks. Those events are our testimony. They testify to the greatness, the validity, and the superiority of Jesus. They show that his greater message was true. And so he continues with his dialogue about angels, that it was, it was not to the angels that humanity was told to come, but to who? To, to Jesus. Why? Because according to verse 8, God made everything subject to Jesus. Everything. And so twice here, it makes this reference to Jesus. And it says that Jesus was a little lower than the angels. But it's not a statement of hierarchy. It's not a statement of power or of authority. It's a statement about the incarnate deity of Christ. That, that when God chose to come to earth, and when he chose to put on flesh, he took the form of humanity just as we are. And, and though humanity, all of us, are a little lower than the angels, I want you to notice what the text says, that, that Jesus doesn't stay there. Verse 9 says this, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And here's where things begin to get interesting a little bit. Look at verse 11. He says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Well, what does he mean? What he's saying here is that there's a kinship that Jesus shares with us, with humanity. A kinship that he doesn't share with the angels. That when Jesus took on flesh, he, he also became part of humanity. And, and it's, it's through that act that all of us share a familial connection with Jesus that frankly the angels do not have and will never have. And so he says in verse 14, hey, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And, and, and the cool part about Hebrews is that if you're reading along with me, I don't, I don't need to do the cross-referencing for you. You just look in the, in the footnotes, footnotes the, the writer's already done that. He's showing us, he's showing you the reader from Psalms, from 2 Samuel, from 1 Chronicles, from Deuteronomy, from Isaiah, and so on, who Jesus is and why Jesus is greater than the angels. 
And not only why we should recognize the greaterness of Jesus, but also why to Jesus, we are so unique and so special. You know, I loved Michael's message last week. It was a message about the love that God has for us. And it's a reminder that we need every once in a while. In fact, we, it's a reminder that we need every moment of every day that God loves us, that we are special to God, that we are special to Jesus. You know, I mentioned watching baseball earlier in this message, and I guess it must have just been on my mind because when I started thinking about, you know, angels this week and like, what was the first thing that came to my mind? Well, it was one of those favorite childhood movies of mine, Angels in the Outfield. It was, it was easy to watch that movie or, or lots of other angel themed TV shows from the 80s or 90s. Like, remember that Michael Landon show, Highway to Heaven? Like, I love that, that show as a kid. Or I remember Touched by an Angel. My mom loved that show when I was a kid. Or, or even that movie, I think it was a John Travolta movie, like Michael or something. Like we watched all those and we thought, man, how great it must be to be an angel, to, to know God, to see God, to have interesting power, to have interesting authority. But if there's one thing that Hebrews 1 and 2 reminds us of, it's that God had a greater plan and a greater purpose, not for the angels, but for us. He said that the angels were sent as ministering spirits, that they were sent in service to us. And so when you go back to the creation account, and you reflect on what it means to be made in God's image, and you reflect on what it meant for Adam and Eve and all of us to be given dominion over the whole earth. All of a sudden, the picture of God's creation becomes that much clearer. It comes into full view. We, we aren't just some creature, some random creature walking on earth. Guys, we were created as administrators in God's earthly realm. We were created as administrators in the earthly realm. And the angels are servants in the heavenly realm. We are the administrators over the earth. They are servants in heaven. And so it is to us that God says, for I so loved that world, earth, that I gave my one and only son that, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Church, Hebrews 2, 16 says this. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, humanity, the faithful. You know, many of us are familiar with the story about Satan and the, the fallen angels, right? Well, one of early Christendom's great theories or beliefs about their fall was, was rooted actually in angelic jealousy toward us, toward humanity. That it was their belief that they should not be subservient to lesser beings that, that drove some of these angels to rebel uh, in their own like heavenly realm. It was the angels being jealous of us. Now, I don't know if that's true, I certainly wasn't there, and I can't speak on that with total confidence, but I thought it was thought-provoking enough that I wanted to share it with you a little bit this morning. But what I want you to see, and what the, the writer of Hebrews wants readers to see, is that not only is Jesus the greater messenger with a greater message, but that message is a message of hope and salvation, not for the angels, but for humanity. And so it's, it's Hebrews chapter three, verse one, that forms the, the bridge between where we're gonna end today's message and pick up next week's message. The author begins chapter three this way. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. I want you to notice the, the, the transcendent language here. Because while we, we live in and we know the earthly realm, the author reminds us that we will share in the heavenly calling. 
So what are we called to do? Well, chapter 3, verse 1 says it's, it, we're called to fix our thoughts on Jesus. Now, we'll get more into the apostle and the high priest language next week. But for now, the, the actionable step from the author, for these, these readers, these Hellenistic Jewish readers, was about fixing their thoughts on Jesus. And I want to go back momentarily to that, that baseball imagery once again. Because I know how easy it would be to let Hebrews become purely an academic exercise and to walk away from it and, and, and fail to see what it's calling me, Josh, or you, whoever you are, to go and do. And I always want there to be something practical that we can take from any message. Otherwise, it, it runs the risk, frankly, of becoming uh, head knowledge that, that puffs us up. You know, when I played baseball, and this, is, this probably goes for any sport with a ball, there was one constant reminder that I heard again and again and again from my coach. Josh, you, you gotta keep your eye on the ball. It was the coach reminding me and everyone else that there are loads of distractions. There are loads of things that can take our attention away from what our attention should be on. You know, I could be up there batting and I could notice what the left fielder was doing. I could notice what the umpire was doing. I could notice what my parents were doing. Or I, I could notice what some dog was doing way off in the distance. And none of those things were going to help me hit a baseball. And so if I allowed my eye to wander toward the distractions, I would immediately become completely ineffective at being a baseball player. I needed that reminder to keep my eye on the ball at all times. And it was only in keeping my eye on the ball that I could hit the ball or catch the ball or do whatever I needed to do with that ball. I had to watch it. And every once in a great while, you'll be watching an NFL game or a Major League Baseball game, and for just a brief moment, you watch, and the receiver or the outfielder or the batter or whoever it is takes their eye off the ball, and they pay attention to something else, and they completely mess up what their ultimate goal was. Church, our faith is kind of like that. And for the audience who reads Hebrews, the, the author is issuing a strong reminder, in a sense, to keep your eyes on the ball. He says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. And what happens when they don't? Well, the answer comes in, in Hebrews 2, verse 1. They begin to drift away. How many of us have been Christians for so many years that we don't even realize when we've taken our eye off the ball. And so I have a little exercise for you. I want everyone to do this, even you sitting at home. I don't care if you look silly, no one else does either. Do this with me. I want you to take your index finger and I want you to hold it up in front of your face. And I want you to focus on your finger. But then I want you to keep your finger there and instead focus on something off in the distance behind your finger. Do you see how you can look right through your finger? Do you see how that finger kind of like shades whatever it is that you're actually looking at? Well, for the author of Hebrews, that, that's kind of what has happened to their faith. That they've shifted their attention away from the, the, the here and now, away from the nearer and greater Jesus. And instead they began to look at things in the distance. And they've begun to get content, not with seeing Jesus, but with seeing a Jesus-shaded version of everything else. The author's words are about taking your eyes off what is in the distance so that you can see clearly to see the greater messenger that's right there in front of you the whole time. Stop looking out there and start looking at what is better right in front of you. Uh, we went deep sea fishing recently while I was on vacation. And we got that reminder of how easily and how quickly you can drift. You're just out there in a boat, you don't realize it, and you look up and you are not where you started anymore. Like drifting just happens when, when we aren't fixing our eyes in the right place. And so actually it's funny, when you look up nautical information about how to see or how to tell if you're drifting, do you know what they tell you? I, this is a quote straight from a website. 
They said, look through a nearby fixed object at the background. And if the background is moving, so are you. So basically what they're saying is pick something that is nearer and focus on it. And then you will see clearly to see if the background is changing behind you. And if it is, you are drifting. Church, many of us are focused on the background. We're focused on everything but Jesus. We're out here. And Hebrews reminds us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. And that requires a greater intentionality. It doesn't happen accidentally. It happens through things like prayer. It happens through study. It happens through, through gathering for fellowship. It happens at the Lord's Supper. It happens with the way that you spend your time. All of those things are examples of intentionality. And you can look past prayer to look at your phone. And you can look past study to watch your television. And you can look past gathering for fellowship to, to sleep in. You can look past the Lord's Supper and, and, and miss the body and blood of Christ. You can look past time spent with God and spend your time on everything else. And if that sounds more like you, and frankly, sometimes it sounds more like me, then there's probably a pretty good chance that you've drifted. And you need that reminder to keep your eye on the ball, to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Church, the angels were created for you and I not you and I for them. And I don't want you to miss how important you are to Jesus and then do everything in your power to show him how important he is to you. Are you looking at him or are you looking past him? Are your thoughts fixed on him or are they fixed on the media, the politics, your family, your misery, your suffering, yourself, the president, your career, baseball? Church, the, the call here is to change your gaze, change your gaze. And in so doing, see the new and greater messenger that is Jesus. His message for you is to save you. And so I just wanna invite you, if you would like to receive salvation from Jesus, if you'd like to receive his love and his grace and his mercy today, he's right there in front of you and I invite you to that. Would you send us an email? Write me at questions at lakemercedchurch.com and we would love to show you more about Christ's love for you. In the meantime, thank you for joining us today. Be encouraged friends and fix your thoughts on Jesus this week. I will see you next week. God bless you. When I was a teenager, one of my favorite movies was Enter the Dragon, featuring the late, great martial artist and actor Bruce Lee. 
In the film, there's a scene where Lee's character, who is a martial arts teacher, like the actor, is giving a young man some instruction about trusting his instincts rather than overthinking a situation when he's in the middle of combat. And to illustrate the point, Lee raises his hand and he says, it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. And then he looks at the student and sees that the student is actually looking at his finger. And he gives him a love tap alongside the head and he says, don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. Sometimes we just need a love tap alongside the head to be reminded of the fact that while it's easy to be distracted with the things that are right in front of our face, it's more important that we keep our focus always centered on the direction where it really ought to be aimed. And that is, of course, toward heaven, toward our eternal home, toward our Father, and toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Josh's lesson today was kind of that love tap alongside the head as he presented some thoughts from the book of Hebrews that were intended to redirect our focus. And I hope that all of us, as we go through the next few days, will stop allowing ourselves to look at the finger or whatever the distraction is that's right in front of our eyes and force ourselves to focus on the heavenly glory that's beyond our earthly view. Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, help us. Help us, Father, who are so bound by the material things that surround us in this world and are the realities of our physical lives to be able to focus upon you, whom we can't see with our natural eye, and to keep our focus always upward and not outward on the things that are immediately before us and that surround us that so easily distract us from our real purpose of walking in the footsteps of Jesus. We appreciate, Father, your servant who wrote the book of Hebrews to give us that reminder of where our real direction in life is and to help us, Father, to continually center ourselves in that direction that we ought to be aiming and the, the focus with which we ought to be looking. Father, it's so easy when there are so many things in this chaotic world that draw our attention and that distract us and that cause us frustration or worry or anger or anxiety. But if we just focus upon you, if we just keep looking at that heavenly glory, all of those fears and frustrations fade into the background and we can truly be directed in the way that we ought to go. Father, we just ask that you help us to have that focus in our lives and to encourage one another as we all struggle with that focus from time to time. Father, we just ask that you would be with us this coming week, that you would continue to guide us and bless us and uplift us, Father, and uplift our eyes always toward you and return us day after day, Father, to the pages of your word so that we can redirect our focus through the things that you have inspired for our instruction and be reminded of that heavenly glory that lies above and beyond. Father, we would just ask that we would keep us safe this week, keep us strong in our walk of faith. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to be able to help others 
to also find their way to you. Thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for never giving up or forgetting about us, but always keeping your focus upon us. And I pray, Father, that we always keep our focus upon you and upon your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, thank you so much again for being here with the Lake Merced Church of Christ. Uh, we got to fix our eyes and our thoughts on Jesus. Did you think like right now, just look at the news cycle. Think about all the things that you've got to get done today. You've got laundry, you've got dinner to cook, all this stuff. It's so easy to be thinking about other stuff and to lose sight of that, of that Jesus, that, that greater messenger and that greater message that's there in your life. Don't lose sight of that today. I would definitely want to invite you to click like and click share if you haven't already. Uh, help encourage someone and bless them with the good news of Jesus, the, the, the greater messenger that he is. And uh, also some exciting news. Uh, next Sunday, uh, weather permitting and air quality permitting, we are planning to reopen of sorts right here at the Lake Merced Church of Christ, uh, outdoors, uh, so, so bundle up, come warm, and, and we're gonna come and gather. It's gonna look different, it's gonna feel different, and what it looks and feels like is not even fully decided yet, but we're gonna be here in person together. And I, I praise God for that. I know some of our older members even feel comfortable doing that. So if you are, are ready and, and excited to get back together, we wanna invite you. We're gonna be right outside these doors in our little courtyard here, 777 Brotherhood Way. We'll be live streaming that, uh, that, that worship time. So it's gonna look a lot different next week. Uh, but be here with us. Hit like, hit share, and fix your thoughts on Jesus this week. God bless you, friends. We'll see you next week.